I, I thought that we knew everything already until I started doing research. And for me to come in and be like, I have to lay the foundations of knowledge, it's weird. It feels like I'm bending the laws of nature. It's like, it's hard to know where to go or where to look. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, it's, so like sometimes it's just, um, you know, whatever you want to see, take yourself there, uh, take that risk. And um, if it doesn't take you anywhere, then you'll have your answer. But more times than not, you'll realize that it opens and it, it doesn't end. Like you might explore something impossible and start to see that it's actually leading you to something. You might be afraid that it leads you astray. But even then, what's the point of life if you're not even enjoying being astray? Because that's probably what our whole lives might feel like. It's about, it's like enjoying that chase too. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still in Cambridge, in Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about brain technologies. We have Alexi Shwery joining us on the show. Hello. Hey everyone. Thank you Good so much here, for coming Alan. on. I'm really grateful for Sir Anoush Babakanova for introducing us. Thank you. We love you. We love you, Sir Anoush. <laughs> Shout out to you. And this is gonna be a lot of fun. Alexi's background, check this out. He's a neuroengineer paving the way for interfacing our minds with machines. He's a PhD student at MIT, working on developing new technologies to help us understand and repair the brain. And you can check out Alexi's LinkedIn link below. All right, Alexi, let's start things off with <laughs> the, one of our favorite questions we like asking. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth what is your current take on the state of humanity? State of humanity. I think we can go both ways. Things are going good. Things are going bad. Things are going. Um, I think uh, I'd like to be optimistic. Um, I think uh, each moment, I, I feel like the, the human spirit, um, we, when things go down, when we hit rock bottom, we'll find a way to pick ourselves up. Um, it's cyclical, it goes up and down, but overall trajectory is going up. Um, and I think, you know, times right now seems like they might be plateauing. There's, there's tension, but I, uh, I trust we'll pull ourselves out. I think we always do. So that's kind of my take on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope that this time that we are uh, approaching this very, uh, prominent slash pinnacle moment of technological advancement and development that we make it through uh, and not go back. <laughs> yeah, no. no more cycles, no just, more. just up, just yeah. acceleration. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, feel yeah. that. Yeah, I feel that for sure. We have a lot, to, a lot that we're dealing with. Yeah. Um, let's jump into the journey. Okay, how did you become who you are today? Because born in Lebanon and then came to the US and then back to Lebanon. So I was initially born in the US, okay. um, but my parents wanted me to grow up in Lebanon. So I had my first birthday there with my twin brother and uh, pretty much grew up there and then came back to the US for, uh, for high school and college. And now I'm still here. Um, born so here, we're... back to Lebanon for 12 years? 12 years, 12 yeah. years with, you said a brother, you have twin brother? Yeah, I, I have a couple of other siblings too, okay. but you know. Uh, you have a we, twin though? Yes, I do. He okay. looks nothing like me. Oh, he doesn't. Robert. <laughs> Robert. Yeah, yeah that's. Robbie. Yeah, because how, how would I know? You could potentially be Bob. Oh, that's he, the he has red hair and he freckles. Has, oh, he has red hair and yeah. freckles. <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah. How'd that happen? Yeah. yeah. Adoption, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, my, pa my parents wanted me to go back. Uh, things were settled there. They had left because of issues there initially, but um, you know they wanted me to f uh, figure out my roots, culture, pick that up. Uh, being there was amazing. Um, very diverse, beautiful country. Uh, there's political turmo turmoil from time to time. Got exposure to poverty, war, uh, different religions. Uh, we did ultimately leave in 2006 because of a war that broke out. So I was a U.S. citizen living abroad um, in Lebanon, being Lebanese. And uh, yeah, we were evacuated by the, uh, by the American military. So I had, to, I had to leave. I couldn't say bye to my friends or family. Uh, it was a quick decision. My mom woke me up out of bed and we had to go. Um, then we... Uh, it was like that. You literally... My mom woke me up, woke said, up. grab a backpack, we're leaving. I didn't know I was coming to the U.S. I was still in the sixth grade. Uh, I had loved the U.S. I came once uh, for, for a wedding, but 
uh, beyond that, it, it happened all of a sudden. That's how, that's how wars work. So uh, wow, yeah, you know, yeah. things happen for a reason. They inspired me, uh, showed me the the true nature of the world, um, or at least they, um, how humans can do things that you know. I kind of view things as um, I never feel bad. I never feel. Um, um, I kind of feel like these are all things I look at and it inspires me what I want the future to look like. So it's not really something that I, I don't embody the fear that I experienced. In general, I, you know, it was an adventure. That's how I view it. And it, all it does is push me. It doesn't stop me. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, the scary part was really coming to the US. It was, it was a culture shock. I hadn't really, we moved to Arizona, um, the desert and uh, uh, just, trying to come and make new friends all of a sudden get used to the culture i think that was one of the biggest elements but yeah. um but yeah that um growing up in the middle east i felt like uh science was my rock um, i felt like uh there are different religions uh people are fighting um for i found um i felt drawn to nature i used to love watching nature videos I felt like uh, science had answers. So, there, there was numbers. There was no argument. So to me, at that at that point in my life, I really felt like uh, science gave me a sense of stability about maybe we can find ways to explain uh, what's going on around us, um, uh, and that way we can develop ways to intervene. So from from my mind, I felt by understanding what's happening around us, we can engineer solutions. Um, and I fundamentally was interested in humans and the human condition um, and that led me to being interested uh, in the mind uh, in the brain and how we behave why we behave um, you know and, and um, I initially wanted to be a doctor to help people but then as I saw that things go beyond the body like I also studied economics in college I got very interested in poverty I got very interested in many many other things so like holistically how can we how can we intervene because um, science is, is, is one element that I start to realize over time. Um, but yeah. The, yeah. The, the story of, of you seeing the human behavior around you and wanting to understand how humans work in order to be able to tackle um, and to intervene um, in uh, creating potentially more peace and harmony. Um, I think that's very beautiful when you position science as this rock that's an objective rock and in a very subjective battle of yeah. thoughts um, and all this other type of yeah. Yeah, stuff. And you know, I, I think it, I rationalized, and I think initially it was, I was emotionally drawn to it. It's just, you're curious about the nature of reality. Um, uh, also my interaction with my cousin who had brain cancer, when he was eight, he's, he's much older now. Uh, things like that begin you begin to question like why is there disease can I do anything about it what is cancer you know my my family didn't really know how to dive deeper they just knew what it was so it was like kind of my curiosity with there are problems here you know just at a very young age um, and no one had the answers I would ask the dumbest questions all the time why are bananas yellow why is the sky blue and like my parents just had to deal with that, you know? It's just, there was something about where I was, I was not satisfied with the answers I was getting, um, which drove me deeper and deeper into trying to figure things out. Not only because I'm inherently curious, that's I think great. that's one, one element, but. Um, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, probably the most important driving force. And then, you know, the applications of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you would, you would take the curiosity that you have about, you know, really why does cancer happen or why are bananas yellow? And yeah. you would apply that understanding into learning about how um, things actually work in the world. It's like a translational curiosity, yeah. um, one that gives you an expanded awareness. You have the story of, of, um, of being, you know, having war or, um, or any type of, of violent um, uprising cause a uh, an evacuation um, is a nuts um, thing to happen, but it's also very interesting how you phrase it as something that potentially has uh, been that this great challenge that you've now found the greatest treasures on the other side of. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, at this point in my life, I try and transcend like the duality of good or bad. Mm. I think things are con there's contrast, and it steers us um, because I. 
I can be a very pessimistic um, if I want to, and it could hold me back, you know. And sometimes all we have is what's in front of us. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, I, when, you, when you feel like you're a victim long enough um, and you exhaust yourself, you can't help but feel like there has to be something I can do and I can't just sit here. And, and you know, I, I always feel like, um, yeah, the, thi the things that happen to me propel me and I am grateful for them in, yeah. in, in, a, in a way. Not that I'm masochistic or anything, it's just like... Totally just <laughs> yeah. grateful for the challenges for us to um, have the, um, a goal of overcoming them and learning. Yeah. Um, you, you know, this is, you know, it's making more sense about how you shaped your, um, your uh, interest in, in neuroscience and human behavior. Um, now I want, to, I want to get a little bit um, uh, deeper into, uh, uh, you know, at the same time as you're really making the, the move here and you're like 12 when you're making the move here and you're in Arizona, but then you end up pursuing your PhD at MIT, yeah. right? Throughout this process, you also have a, through your insatiable curiosity, you're realizing, you know, how crazy interesting it is that we have this consciousness that it gives us the ability to perceive and educate ourselves and to feel and also create. Yeah. So I loved how you were you know, teaching about that. Yeah, I, I, I think in a way I was, uh, I was in high school and I was like, what am I going to do? And I, I, I just felt like somehow the mind was this singular point, the black box that encompassed us, you know? You have to fundamentally understand biology to understand the brain. That can really help us just understand how cells work. But then there's mind and behavior, which might help us with um, dealing with, with poverty, with mental health, with, uh, with violence, things at the political level, law, and even try and derive computations for artificial intelligence. I just felt like if I could be in this space, um, that I could just maximize my effect on many, many things and fundamentally understand myself, which I think we're all doing every day, and f understand others and try and bridge that gap and make things more relatable. I think sometimes the, the brain taught me how to forgive people. If, if, you know, I remember earlier in my life, it's like if someone was angry, you know, I would just be like, this is a response. This is, this is all they know. It, I, I, it was an object that allowed, it almost allowed me to blame their brain and not them. You know, you can, you can find many ways to, to, to develop empathy, you know, um, studying sociopaths or, you know, things of that form. It just made me feel like there's, there's a tangibility to, to the problems in the world, um, if we can understand the brain. Um, so yeah, so um, that led me, um, so I, I, I did a lot of research in college. Uh, I was interested in uh, just understanding how neurons work and how they, uh, how genetics might relate to uh, neurological disorders. Um, but then I start to realize that um, when I got to grad school at MIT, that I got less interested in dis discovering things because I felt we were limited by our technologies. And I just think it's in the air at MIT. Uh, so I, I picked up uh, engineering. Uh, neuroengineering specifically is a field to develop technologies that can make us uh, and we use the word interrogate the brain, study the brain in ways we couldn't before. Um, and you know, there's a funny analogy where neuroscience right now is we're trying to paint a car to get to the moon. So meaning like we need, we need more tools. We need to build rockets. We yeah. need to build telescopes. Like we are, there are- Using paintbrushes instead of, yeah, making the new tools. Yeah, rockets, telescopes, so that's a great I, way to put it. I yeah. felt that um, when I was trying to decide what to do with my PhD, I felt in a way very hopeless that um, the conclusions that we make about the brain, that because it's so complex, billions of neurons with trillions connections, millions of molecules in each neuron, um, I just felt like there is no way in my lifetime that I'm going to, to help. Um, so I, I felt like in, in order to catalyze this, I needed to enter the, enter the technology space to help empower us, to build the tools to help us see further, to expand uh, the visibility, get more numbers, more data, whatever it takes to understand the system. So that was uh, the mindset I took to enter the neurotechnology space was to 
it gives us the ability to understand the brain and by understanding its intricacies we can uh, think of intricate solutions. Um, so really it, it's kind of like this feedback of understanding what the problem is which we fundamentally do not know what causes disease um, in the brain. Uh, we don't even know how a single neuron works and uh, there are people that study worms that have only 300 neurons compared to like 100 billion. Mm -hmm. We don't even know how it makes decisions. So just to say like there's work that needs to be done but there are efforts in this space um, an attempt to again tie into all the things I said that would maximize impact like the brain in yeah. some ways is the last uh, frontier at least we think right now. Um, yeah well we think right now. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> because new, we hit a, a wall. Yeah. yeah hopefully new frontiers continue continuously open up. Um, I like how you explained that um, taking an engineering lens uh, enables us to um, have more tools of building the, the telescopes and the, and the rockets um, to actually get to the moon with the yeah. brain. Um, that's a really good way to put it. Also, the tools um, open up more creative solutions for um, other people to, to yeah. um, study the brain as well as build more tools themselves. They gain inspiration from that. So yeah. that's a great way of putting um, neuroengineering specifically. In, in a way to, to wrap that up, um, um, what developing to research tools specifically, um, it allows you to answer questions you couldn't answer before. So you can have as many questions as you want, but if you don't have ways of exploring them, they're just going to be questions. So really it, it enables us to explore the questions we've always wanted to. Um, so, you know, in a way it's, yeah, it's, um, it's very important to help us understand things. And, to me, fundamentally, um, there's no point intervening until we understand. And a lot of time we're looking for uh, magic bullets and things of that form, and they're, they're riskier. As, as things get more and more complicated, we're working with uh, higher dimensions, uh, higher dimensional data sets. The brain is just too complex to just find one thing. So we need to, uh, to really understand its complexity, and that requires more complex tools. Um, Billions of neurons. Uh, uh, trillions of connections and millions of molecules in every neuron. Yeah. That's crazy. As Thousands, millions, yeah. I don't know how many molecules are in each, but yeah. But that's there's just, a, yeah, that's crazy that we're, There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's so much going on. And then to be able to make the tools that make it better for us to do, understand ourselves, understand others, understand human behavior, and then also understand how to cure the diseases that plague so many of us, dementia, et cetera. Um, teach us about your fascination with making the tools that is um, gonna help with curing disease and what, because you were telling me earlier, you're like, what are we gonna do, put a wire on every neuron? So what are you thinking is, um, is the way that we tackle this? So, so I, I think sometimes, um there are kind of limits to our imagination. And I, I feel like right now this is the best we can do given what's available to us. Uh, because sometimes when I look further out, it, it feels like there's something better, always. And I, I think it's about building what we can now, seeing its flaws and uh, making them obsolete and moving forward. So in some ways, um, a lot of the technologies being developed in this space are not ready for humans. Um, we have bigger brains, we have more neurons. Uh, that will require scaling of some form um, and finding ways that are less invasive if we decide that we want to um, start directly connecting things with the, with the skull. I think elements, uh, I think, you know, physicists might find ways of really um, developing new forms of uh, uh, let's say penetrating the skull and stimulating or uh, inhibiting neurons think about uh, you know think about the first part is understanding the brain is understanding the notes to a piano to a song and then uh, we need to develop the fingers to go back in and play them mm -hmm. so if you have a diseased brain and a healthy brain we want to know the difference in how the brain is computing mm -hmm. and then understanding is literally one part. The next part is reintroducing those computations artificially to bring us back to a normal state of how the brain should be operating. Interesting. The reintroduction of what the degeneration has caused in a computational way yeah. with a, like a, with an um, excitatory. Yes. Uh, 
And so we're, we're, tr we're trying to figure out what the fingers, how to make these fingers to yeah. play those notes again. Yeah. So if you, if you have Alzheimer's and you've, you forgot your memories, um, we technically need to know what memory is, where are they stored, how are they stored, so we know how to intervene and re-upload your memories hypothetically. So it's, it's really this interplay of right now we are in the phase of uh, we need to understand what's happening, at least that's my opinion, and then that will lead to um, a sense of where can we intervene and then we would develop intervention methods for that. Um, okay, so... But that's much lo more long-term. I really liked how you discuss the importance of understanding how the brain works as this most important principle because otherwise it almost seems as though everything else that we're doing is a little bit not educated enough of a, of a guess, of an understanding pre-tackling um, neurodegeneration or, or pre-tackling um, stimulation, etc. Yeah, I mean, there are no cures for neurological disorders, disorders zero. Uh, clinical trials are being shut down. Pharma companies are spending billions of dollars. Nothing is working. Uh, because uh, we're, we're trying to find simple solutions for complex problems, which I think is important. But, you know, it's coming from a place where uh, we're studying, uh, let's say, animals and we're trying to bring it to humans and our brains are different. I mean, we're much, we're just different than, than, than a mouse, uh, which is, you know, what scientists study um, because that's what's available. And then when things move up to, to humans, uh, things start to break down when it comes to the brain. We've been able to you know, develop um, ways of treating infection and cancer, but neurological disorder, um, we're finding a hard time, and mainly because we don't understand the brain, and trying to understand it is very complex, as, as I just kind of gave you a sense of that. And you know, this is all under the assumption that we're, again, I, sometimes I like to play devil's advocate where the brain is also inside of a body. I mean, there is the rest of the body, like we are part of a system. Um, so degeneration can, let's, you know, the disease could be caused by something else. My behavior could be caused by the adrenaline being pumped from another part of my body. So like, I think, um, but you know, science is attempting to just find all the pieces and we will integrate it together at some point. But right now the, the brain is so unknown that we just need to, to chip away at it and see what comes from it. Um, I think something that you and I were talking about right before the interview was that there are non-technological interventions that can augment the, our health to such a degree where potentially we don't even die from the onset of cancer. We don't yeah. die from the onset of Alzheimer's, but maybe something else. Yeah. But so how do we do that in a non-technological way? Yeah, so um, I think sometimes uh, science is an attempt at uh, generalization. So the ability to study something and apply it to mass population. Uh, and in, you know, in a way, each human is just special. I mean, our genetic makeups, our lives, you know, where we are, our epigenome, you know, no one might ever live the same life I had, eat, eat the same food I've had gone. So like, what is inside my body is so complex. Um, so sometimes, you know, uh, science, science is attempting to do that. But at the same time, we also need to find ways to um, take preventative measures, you know, I mean, uh, some, uh, some people might have bad habits. Uh, it, in a way, like I, I don't want to um, go here, but there are financial structures that lead us sometimes with the momentum of developing. Um, you know, sometimes there's a momentum, financial incentive to do science and 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 um, develop medications, and I think it should happen. But I also think that um, if our if we want to solve a problem, you know, there's also ways that we can. Uh, minimize health risks um, whatever that whatever that is for this people is really thinking yeah. outside the box uh, right now it's we're stuck with the model of ah the pharmaceuticals ah the trials ah yeah. but really the way that we behave in a day-to-day -day basis if we're more meditative we're less stressful if yeah. we eat better and exercise yeah. more and don't smoke yeah. uh, we can live longer yeah. uh, and prevent the onset of some of these yeah. physiological issues yeah and yeah so that's that's why i think um, 
in addition to science, people should really try and become more in tune with themselves. I mean, w once you go to an N of one, which is one person, I mean, there's no more statistics. So whatever it takes to make you feel good, it can be subjective. Uh, you can be experimental with yourself. And I mean that just like figure out what works for you, what makes you feel good. What can you eat that makes you feel good? What, you know, and how much does your mind play a role over your body? So like these are things that um, that should be, be, be done in parallel and complementary. Um, I, you know, I, I think um, science has done amazing things and it will continue to, um, but I think it's important that we also, you know, there's something that, um, like I just mentioned, the scale of the brain, when you reduce each individual to all these molecules and all these neurons, it just gets really hard to figure out like, what's happening for each in the, like for me to understand who you are, I would need to technically have your brain, analyze your brain and your environment. Yeah. Like what are you eating every day? Who are you talking, like there's, your brain takes in inputs, it takes in stimuli. So like it is not separate from your environment. So for me to really understand you, I would have to follow you your whole life. And me, you'd have to have wearables, I would have to take your blood, you know, it's just, it gets a little ridiculous. I know we're, we're moving towards a data driven world, but, you know, how much resolution do we need? How big of a data set do we need? And, you know, you, it's like you need to know everything that's happening around you. So it, it becomes like you have to almost like, how are you going to do that for each person for over, over their lifetime? So like... To 100% understand another person, you would need every <laughs> single one of their sensory inputs they've had throughout their entire life and even <laughs> prior to that, yeah, yeah. So th this is where things break down for me sometimes when I look far into the future. Uh, I think it's okay to explore the unknown because it hasn't been done. Um, and I think, you know, this is how we, we push the limits of humanity is just doing what we know is within the bounds of our imagination right now hitting that wall, breaking through it, and thinking of something better. So, but right now, you know, I, I could see the walls with a reductionist mentality, which is what science is attempting. It's done a really good job um, in helping us build things and get to the moon. Um, but as we get to biological systems, it's noisy. It's very, pro uh, there's a lot of statistics, a lot of chance, a lot of noise. It's just, uh, um, it gets scary. Engin engineers are, and physicists and mathematicians are entering this space because it's, it's a challenge and they're looking for a challenge. Um, yeah. And uh, the biggest we're challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're scared and excited, at least I am, um, to get a handle on this. And uh, I think we need to be open minded and humble to what the limits are because I think sometimes we come in with this is, I came in, you know, I'm halfway through my PhD program, really feeling like this is going to solve everything. Um, and I still think it should be pursued, but I also think we should be looking for, for other ways, like we had touched on the individual. Um, and, you know, again, science is assuming that math and physics are real. I mean, that's the foundation of it. We invented numbers, you know, one and two, the idea that we can separate things, that things are causal and interact. But like how I just said, the environment and the brain are intertwined. So really, is there me and the environment or is there, is it all like it's one? It's all one, yeah. So that, that's when it gets weird. Like what, what do I do? I'm creating this separate artificial separation to study it and then to intervene artificially. And it works, but sometimes it gets, it starts to break down a bit. And it's, 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 it's not easy to talk about this because this is what our, what I, it's I been like, built on. I like this, this approach of it's it's a it, it's a very curious it's a philosophical it's a it's a it's an approach that does not separate the brain from the environment to such a degree that they are so coupled yeah. in this this realm of oneness yeah. that we could we could go as far as to say that the the cities that we live in are potentially um, causing a certain percentage of the neurodegeneration that we experience yeah. um, the stress that we take on from the nine to five grinds yeah. that we're on yeah the even yeah. this couch here yeah. is this really the most optimal way for our bodies to be sitting yeah. while we're having a conversation yeah. no yeah. there's a much more optimal yeah. way for our bodies to yeah. be positioned 
Yeah, so in a way, like, it, I, you, you see where I'm coming from. Um, and, we're, you know, pe people in the public health space are trying to understand things at, like, a more global perspective, macro scale, like our behaviors, what do we buy, where are we going? But yeah, at the end of the day, in, in a weird way, all we have are, is ourselves. And the only thing monitoring ourselves each moment is our intuition. And we can try and help use uh, wearables and tools to bring those things to our awareness to help us make sense of what we want to do, what choices we want to make. Because you, know, you are your own authority. Um, but you know, we, we're, we're, tr we're trying to, to make sense of it and it's important. And yes, we should explore the things. Um, so one, besides disease, again, but this also will tie to the solution is, imagine that we're all perfectly healthy. And okay. I'm gonna take this space. Uh, and um, there's something more than that. I think, uh, I still think we w there might be problems if all disease is cured. I think there's something about finding our role where we are in each moment that causes problems too. Our relationships with ourselves. Yeah, meaning, finding meaning. Yeah, and I, I think things eventually also that's something we need to address. I think we get lost in the rationale. I think for a while, like I, I was driven by science because of, out of curiosity, then when you start really thinking about things like this, meaning um, things break down and it becomes subjective to everyone. Um, and when you try to really create an objective reality for everyone, it starts putting people in a box. And I, I think it kind of, even if you're perfectly healthy, might not feel like you want to fit in that in that system of how things should work. Um, so yeah, like um, I, I do feel like it's hard to tell exactly, that could cause stress, that could uh, uh, suppress your immune system, that might lead to riskier behaviors and all these other diseases. Like it could tie into just like this existential, I could literally sit here and induce stress in my body if I wanted to. Like, you know what I mean? I could sit here and worry. Uh, if I really kind of am thinking about my place in in reality, so like, yeah. I I do I do think um, what people think of themselves and the relation You'd to others. You'd be killing is super yourself important. faster if you're doing with that. your mind, with yeah, your mind. in in yeah. an interesting way, yeah. So yeah. we need to be uh, conscious of how we make ourselves feel. Uh, you know, it's very easy to fall into a rut and not feel good about yourself. I mean, it's just part of human nature. And sometimes we need to catch ourselves and know that it, it doesn't benefit us in any way to do that. You'll start feeling it in your body. I mean, that's a sign that you should try and think better thoughts. But then it's like, ah, we, we might feel that negativity is, we need to think, because you might find yourself in a negative loop because you're thinking and you want to find the solution. But sometimes it's just, again, like I had said about my life, being hopeful, that just that attitude shift might be enough for you to see things differently and actually be healthier and feel like you can make the right choices. So it gets hard, you know, it gets hard. It's like if you do science from a place of fear versus, you know, passion and love and hope, you know, you're going to build two different things. You're going to build cures or weapons. So like it does come down to fundamentally like how we feel about ourselves. And it will come down to that, I think, uh, for a lot of things, too. Um, so yeah, th things around us are tools and it comes down to how we feel about ourselves, how we use them. Great power comes great responsibility type stuff. Um, Alexei, I think this is probably the first time that I'm really realizing how much we uh, don't think about the environment that we've built around the human yeah. bodies. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and what that the, the cyclical feedback that we have yeah. between the body and the environment on a moment-to-moment yeah. -moment basis. Um, and I love thinking about it that way. Um, and also, I want to say this, you know, you've also helped me realize that we're, we have, we're, we're using child's play with brain uh, technology right now. We're EEG and fMRI and even uh, trying to put electrodes into uh, even into our brain um, to try and understand the complexity yeah. of it it's child's play and so um, eventually we'll get to a new frontier in yeah. neurotechnology yeah. right you're going, yes. we're gonna make new tools and neuroengineering yeah. it's gonna be fantastic agreed and it's gonna do great work but in the meanwhile yeah 
I think thinking outside of the box in terms of what yeah. our what's going on in our environment and all that kind of stuff is a great way yeah. to do it. In a you use you use this word um, a non technological intervention into health. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, I mean, words are words. You know, there uh, anything can be a technology, even a toothpick. So like in a way, it's just maybe thinking about. Um, because when, uh, when, when I studied economics, I think about s uh, systemic behaviors. How do we operate collectively? And uh, yeah. um, instead of, yes, uh, not taking this reduction in approach, if there are studies showing that if, if a mouse is addicted to cocaine, if you put them in an environment with toys, that they, they, they stop uh, taking the cocaine, their addictions go away. You can think about our world and our habits just come down to there. We're just not happy where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I feel that sometimes that um, if we're in a place where, um, so one thing is like loving yourself, but also feeling that uh, people support you. Community is super important. Culture, music and the humanities, things that lift us up in ways that science can't measure. It's just, um, you can just enter another state um, and your outlook and your health is benefited by that. It's very systemic, it's very holistic. Yeah, and, and you know, to segue, I have thought of ways like instead of trying to really pick at each cell and molecule in the body, what if we built a new city, had another renaissance, got yes. rid of things we don't want to do anymore? Let's say with robots, um, if we can fully automate the things that we don't want to do anymore, um, give people meaning in their lives by giving them the freedom to do what they want when they want and express it without being bound maybe by... Uh, things that they need to do, yes. you know, uh, we, sh like, we need to thrive. And, li and like I said, like, it goes beyond if we are all healthy. It just comes down to what do we do? How, what are, like, we have one life, at least we're told, and uh, um, it's possible that we could develop ways and lifestyles to live forever. Let's say we do live forever. What are we going to do each day? You know, are we going to work every day? Are we going to just do things for other people? Are we going to do things for ourselves? So it comes down to, again, this human centric idea of like, <sighs> how do we change with our society? Do we start from scratch? Do I just, you know, go to the desert, get, get there with a the group of people and just like start a new society? You know, I do think about these things. Um, how can I be myself? How, what if, you know, I think about the, the concept of language, like what if I was born into a world and uh, no one taught me math or English or what the other languages I know? Yeah. How would I make sense of my environment? Yeah. Would it benefit me more to just come up with the explanations myself without trying to fit in? Fit in to so words and numbers. It's radical. It requires you to I be I think about that a lot. Yeah. I, I even go as far as to think of uh, not not teaching language to yeah. a child and keeping them in an environment. I know that that's some radical stuff because um, but, you, yeah. you can get the police. You need <laughs> you structure know, in, a, in a way. You need a structure. It, it brings yeah. us to our feet, but then it's also important that we break away because what... Yeah, we have to what, explore creatively. Yeah. yeah, The construct we live in within language, because words are very loaded, Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's about breaking away from that and looking, finding new ways. How do you find new ways to think, you know? I... Uh, yes. It's, yeah, it's hard and that it somehow comes from you. And if you're original and you're, you're coming up with an idea that no one has came up with before, you feel out of place. You feel like you're crazy. You feel like it's wrong because you need everyone else to agree, but it has to come from a place of originality first. So how do you trust that? You know, yeah. how do you trust yourself? And that's what I mean where it's about this freedom of having an environment where you can bring out new ideas and not feel judged or even judge yourself. And I think that's a, a recipe for innovation and creativity and longevity, things of that form. Yeah. Is our, yeah. yeah. We spend so much money on uh, health and that's preventative. And so yeah. it's interesting thinking about if the basic physiological needs are met and then the creative flourishing is able to happen for every human, how much money would we actually be spending on uh, healthcare at that point? Um, and then also on the, um, on the time side of things, I don't know if, would, how, how fast would we move towards our self-actualization and self-transcendence if we weren't bounded by 80 years of time? Um, yeah. 
(laughs) So the ideas I've toyed around with, which seem very difficult to implement, was if there were a city, what would happen if we didn't have time or age? So I don't have to sit here and feel bad about how old I am and that I'm getting older or that I have a meeting. Like, is there a new way of operating outside of what we are interested in? efficiency and productivity and optimizing what are we optimizing towards like people it's literally it's productivity for the economy it's a a momentum that is taking place that is not even considering the individuals themselves and we're losing ourselves in that yeah and not paying attention to you know it's a good way to put it yeah so in in a way like we want the numbers for the structure can you have a city that operates without numbers and money i think things like uh uh, cryptocurrency are attempting to decentralize finance and empower people yeah, and yeah. things of that form. So, yeah, I, I, I think um, we need to question uh, what our aims are, what are the aims of institutions. Yeah. Um, and it really comes down to each individual in that institution. Are you trying to make money and be productive or are you trying to feel good? Because if you're ignoring that, then you're just creating a beast that, that you don't care about and everyone's creating it together and they don't want to be there. So it's like we have to be careful. And, it, and again, it comes down to response, being responsible as an individual, but not everyone. Um, it, it's hard to leave the momentum. I mean, we're all part of something. So that's why it, sometimes it takes someone brave enough to break away and then bring a group of people together. I mean, it's just it's just the that's how it works. It. I yeah. agree. There's eight billion of us that we're are afraid. Yeah. Yeah. There's, the 8 billion of us are in the rat race and it's a we're moving in the direction of economics and GDP and it's not about in many ways it's not prioritizing human flourishing human creativity Um, like you said what would a city look like these are very fundamental questions that we need children and adolescents and even adults exploring on a more frequent basis what would it look like to have be born where you're not picking up numbers and and language right away but that you're um, building up a different way of modeling the world what would it look like if there was no time or money or don't feel bad about your age all these types of things how would a city like that work where the human is prioritized their health their happiness their meaning all those things are prioritized I love yeah. these thought experiments. Yeah. And it does feel like yeah. we would not have as much of the stress on our bodies that yeah. causes a, our deterioration as quickly. Yeah, and you know, it, it comes down to, I, I like to say that words are spells. I mean, you, you, could, you could label something and you, you have literally created it with that label. So we need to, to pay attention to um, when we look at an object or an experience, we are in a way defining it, but we were also given that definition. So how can we do it in a way that is realistic and still maintain structures and allows us to you know, move towards something that where um, the words you use are just better all the time? You know, like, like, for example, in the English language, people say, I might say, I am angry. Other languages, people say, I have anger. So just that change really affects the relationship I have with the word. Like I, I have told I have it means it's temporary. And yes. So like, it's just, it's not me, it's just passing. So like in a way, you know, I'm, I can't fly right now. Um, but technically I would like to say I can't fly just yet. Yeah. So it, again, like it, it's just about how far can you remove the limits of what's possible. Yeah. I, I would I like to think that anything is possible. Um, I can't sh- prove that right now, but if you could trust that, uh, then you can do things that we couldn't do before. And if you just simply look at history and where we are, we've already proved that we could do anything, but we forget uh, somehow. Um, and it, you know, it's it's kind of scary to, to to take a leap of faith and feel like you can do something no one's done. But that's why it's important to just fundamentally be driven by that curiosity because um, you have to take that chance. Um, and sometimes for me, for me to take that chance, I just tell myself anything's possible because I don't want to do it if it's not going to work. I'm not interested in failing, you know. Yeah. But like, I'll, I'll fail when it comes down to it, um, if it comes down to it. But so far, it's uh, 
all it's done is guide me. So again, reusing these words um, and that, what do we want? Yeah. That, that was really well said is yeah. the I have anger or what, it, you know, we're not flying yet. You know, <laughs> these, the, you, yeah, words are spells. Words are creation, thought is creation. So yeah. um, that's a really important point. And also just relaying back to the rat race hierarchical, eight billion of us in the machine. <laughs> It, it does make sense. Think about when we look at something like a Satoshi Nakamoto, whatever it that is, that it was literally a disconnect, making something completely new, integrating that back in. Yeah. So it's like get out of the 8 billion rat race hierarchy, plug out, make something that obsoletes yeah. Yeah. the old way of thinking in the hierarchy, and then make it so attractive that it becomes the mental map that gets uploaded to all people's code. Yeah. Yeah. And so what would that, you know, what would that be? So uh, uh, I like the, I think stor storytelling is a, is a very powerful tool. And in a way, for all I know, our, our lives are collective stories that we put our eggs in that basket and we believe in it. And uh, it feels very real when you're born into it. And if you start to feel like, ah, there has to be a better story out there, but it's not real. Sometimes I question, why does my brain even allow me to have th thoughts that aren't real? Why can I imagine myself riding a dragon over the sunset? Like, yeah. th that sounds like a waste of time evolutionarily. But I, I think we allow ourselves to stretch that limit just to bring us into possibility and to move us into somewhere. possibility space, yeah. And the, the more convinced you are of your thoughts and you get enough people to want that, and get together and things feel like there is a possibility, then you make it a possibility collectively. So I, I, I think there is, yeah. This is, this is nuts. Yeah. There's, <laughs> almost, there's almost a, a um, the, 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 the burden of genius that people take on is not only related to the amount of, of, of time and relentless work um, that they put on being the first ones to make an advancement uh, for the rest yeah. of civilization. We can ride the dragon over the sunset. <laughs> we can, we can ride the dragon over the sunset. There's, there's a certain, like with this burden of genius, there is a certain amount of creativity outside the original code that you have to realize. And then you're imagining it the flying the dragon over the sunsets maybe a little bit further out yeah. than maybe making a new neuroengineering tool. Yeah. Right. And so then it's up to you then to be able to put together the ability to do so. This again, this brings us again back to the rat in the cage. If we're all trapped in the economic hierarchy of, of civilization, um, think about the amount of uh, play structures that we have. How well is this, you can literally tell the difference a rat in a cage without any to toys and the rat in a cage with toys has significant further yeah. neuronal development and infrastructure that's built out. So why not then be able to build a city, build a, a built environment that radically enables our, uh, the, m the most flourished neural infrastructure and creativity possible. It, it seems as though us rats, <laughs> us humans in this hierarchy are not as uh, able to be maximally flourished as possible. So what I'll say is that it comes down, it's a confidence game. Uh, I, th I think we don't realize how much power we have. Um, you know, in a way we're slaves of our mind and you know, we. We, we're stuck in a pattern because that's, that's how things are. I'm, I'm, just, I'm used to being in my body and walking. I've never tried to fly. I don't think I can fly. Um, but for me to go from zero to one to make something, I have to, in a way, pick a side. Like for me to say anything is possible, I, I have to pick that or else. If I don't say that, then every choice I make is a logistical one. I can only do things within the realm of what is possible. But that's boring because it leaves me to like, everything's already here. What do I do? I just like, sit on my couch and watch TV. Like, how do I go from consumer to creator? How do I make something that doesn't exist? So it requires you to just, again, just for me, it's just, I'm, it's very recent that I'm just trying to adopt this attitude. And it comes from a place of just feeling like there's nowhere else to go except 
bringing what's in your mind out there and yes. to trust that somehow your imaginations can happen. And when you just put yourself out there, you'll be surprised that everyone, a lot of people might have the same thoughts of you. And you build a team and you get together and you share your vision and you share a dream. Um, and I, I think for a very long time, I, I didn't allow myself to dream. I just kind of felt like everything is the way it is and I need to work within those bounds. And until I start really enjoying thinking about the way things are, I become impatient where I'm at and I need to, I need to do what doesn't exist just to test that I can do anything. So it's just simply getting caught in that process of proving the power that we each have to ourselves, I think is our ultimate goal is just unraveling the human potential and seeing that we can do that. Um, and I, I think that's where bliss comes from and motivation and anything that drives us. Um, and that's why, I, that's why I think what we consider challenges or problems are important. I think, uh, I think they help us in a way like love ourselves more by over, overcoming these, these, these obstacles that in a way we've placed ourselves, but we were unaware of them. And that's fine. We just need to realize that there's something we can do about it. Um, but you know, it's hard, you know, in, in a way I, I, will, I will do many things that I feel are so real and it's hard to question them, but it just comes down to like, in a way being fed up. The built environment that we made for the pursuit of meaning and purpose and self-actualization and fulfillment, the basic physiological needs to be met, is just not to the degree that it could be in order to make it easier for people to pursue exactly what you're talking about. Because when you wake up in the morning, you're much less likely to want to radically change the code of civilization uh, than you are currently to get your physiological needs met and keep playing in the game. Um, that it's in and we need more role models to step outside of the game write the new codes bring them back into the game yeah. or even just draw new people out of the game into yeah. the new game yeah. as well so it's almost like building another game simulation yeah. within yeah. yeah within the structure I mean, that's exactly it yeah. there, there there are bubbles of reality which you know we can call culture um, yeah and uh, it comes down to one thing you uh, for the people out there you can either Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, you may either agree or disagree with the statement that anything is possible. I, I, I still have confidence issues with that, but it comes down to putting that to the test because if you can materialize anything in your mind, that'd be the most beautiful thing. You would know what you're capable of and then you would just do that every day. Yes. So it just comes down to like self-experimentation. Just try. Try something small. That's right. Start going to the gym. You didn't think you could lift this. Now you can lift that. You didn't think. I mean, in a PhD, in a way, in a way like we're we're trying to um, introduce knowledge to what we think. Or like, I I thought that we knew everything already until I started doing research. And for me to come in and be like, I have to lay the foundations of knowledge. It's weird. It feels like I'm bending the laws of nature. It's like it's hard to know where to go or where to look. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, it's, so like sometimes it's just, um, you know, whatever you want to see, take yourself there, uh, take that risks. And, um, if it doesn't take you anywhere, then you'll have your answer. But more times than not, you'll realize that it opens and it, it doesn't end. Like you might explore something impossible and start to see that it's actually leading you to something. You might be afraid that it leads you astray. But even then, what's the point of life if you're not even enjoying being astray? Because that's probably what our whole lives might feel like. It's about, it's like enjoying that <sighs> chase too. Obviously, you know, we need to be stable and make money and things of that form, but yeah, it's about challenging ourselves for sure. Even that, just that ending part that we need to be stable, we need to be, you know, that's really what causes people to stay in the hierarchy, to yeah. stay in the culture Yes, a simulation of the bubble because it's safer. It's safer to be in the game that you know. Yeah. It's way harder to leave the game, write new code, yeah. and, and obsolete the old code. Yeah. Either augment it in the original bubble or build your new bubble yeah. and bring people to it. I think thinking about it that way is so damn important and it's in many ways what what I'm trying to piece together yeah. right now with this ultimate synthesis and it's the hardest thing I've ever done 
Um, but at the same time, I know that it's going to be the most rewarding. One of the things that I'm learning about it, and Miel, I'm interested to hear your perspective on it, is that I make more progress towards the ultimate synthesis when I disconnect from my cell phone, when I disconnect from the internet, from my laptop, um, when I disconnect from those things and I just sit. Like if I have a spare 15 minutes in between interviews at 30, like I'm not gonna, I won't do emails or texts or calls or, or definitely not social media, definitely not social media. <laughs> and, I'll, and, I'll just, and I'll just sit here. <laughs> And when I do that, it's very fascinating what silence um, can do for what's going on within yeah. the mind um, at developing, further developing out the creative thinking processes. So what do you think, what, what role do you think disconnecting from the existing culture uh, plays in the development of the new maps? So um, the way I view it is that uh, there's you can be you can be like a recluse and just not be in society but you need context so it's it's not about what you consume but it's your relationship with what you're consuming and uh, sometimes uh, let's say i'm on social media and uh, i might you know look at someone's life that might be that it might appear better than mine i could sit there and uh, constantly attack myself by feeling that way or use that to propel me and inspire me towards something I would like to be. And if I believe that I could do anything, then all that person is doing is bringing to my awareness the things I want in my life. It only hurts when I feel like it's out of my reach. And that's fundamentally why anything causes us suffering is that I want that and cannot have it, you know? So it's, it's really about framing, feeling the confidence and power that you, you can do those things and not placing those limits. Um, Make the impossible but, possible. But it, yes, but if you're in a position where the consumption is not benefiting you, it's not serving you, it's not making you feel good, you just have to notice that and just not know that you not want to do that. But sometimes you're just caught in a loop, you don't know any better, you feel like it's what needs to happen. But again, these are habits that you might not know. But you know, if you tie your, yourself out and feel enough pain and stress, you will literally like um, exhaust yourself to the point where you you'll have to take a nap and not look at your phone. So like really, it's like we're in a river flowing downstream, but really we're swimming upstream, and we think we're we're going upstream. And once your arms get tired, it just carries you. So it's like you just with the stillness and be, you know being quiet. There's a part of you that already knows where you need to go, but you're just kind of your mind is chattering so it's 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 in a weird way there's there's a part of you that knows you better than you do right now and it comes down to mm. like what does it mean to listen to yourself i don't know if i can you know we don't have the the uh hardcore technologies to do that now but all we have is like our that whatever that is i know meditation is attempting to do that but we have all we have different ways of entering meditative states you know uh, like for example like some I don't like doing the dishes, but sometimes I do. It takes attention away from my mind. I'm just feeling the plate, feeling the water, whatever it takes for you to immerse in what you're doing and just stop like beating yourself up Yeah, um, is what it takes. Yeah, Get in the ultimate flow. Yeah. Um, I have so many other questions, um, but we'll have to do another round, um, preferably at the recording studio in SF because there's still so much to unpack about yeah. making new code. Um, to obsolete the old code, yeah. um, to augment the old code. I really like that out-of-box thinking perspective. And yeah. also, I like how um, you apply that to uh, brain technology and neuroengineering. Yeah. And this applies to blockchain and cryptocurrency and biotech yeah. and AI and robotics and spirituality. Yeah. It, applies, it applies to every single yeah. economics. Every field needs the out-of-box thinkers that have a fresh perspective on asking the questions yeah. of why is a banana yellow and why can't I <laughs> I want a ride, purple banana I, why can't <laughs> a purple banana why can't I ride on the dragon over the sunset well yeah. actually you can it's just going to take us a couple it's more decades yeah. and you'll be able to yeah and yet to wrap that up and you know we should stay in touch in regards to that it comes down to simply being radically honest what do I want I'll worry about how I'll get it later it's just being honest with what do I want because most of the time it's 
what can I get? You know, so it, that just, it, it leaves you uh, limited to what your eyes can see, but we can make things. So, and I think if people could start to shift in that way and we can get together and just talk about what do we want, really f make that the parameter. Don't worry about the cost. Uh, I mean, we should, uh, costs and things like that come later, but it's like, I'm, I would like, let's say, imagine to have the simplest cure to cancer, you know, like maybe there, maybe it's out there. Like you know, it's just to give us the opportunity to explore, explore things that might not seem feasible right now. Cause in a way we stand on the shoulders of giants, yep. but um, we need to ask the, what the foundations are and whether we could, uh, you know, rise from the ashes, burn it down and do something else. And when is that, when, when will that happen? Does it need to happen? you know, is constant discussion. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so excited to talk about new codes. Um, yeah, and it, we're, we're in a simulation and we are the programmers of our simulation. That's might, the, literally the yeah. question on the way yeah. out. So you, the question is, are we in a simulation? So I, I personally don't like using that word because- Teach us why and what you would prefer. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, when people say we're in a simulation, they think it's that there's like legitimate numbers and code that are like, we're just like in a game that we can mathematically define. I think it's just, it's, it's way beyond what we can describe right now. In a way, if we want to take a neuroscience perspective, our mind is generating the reality in front of us. What yeah. is beyond our mind and eyes is another thing, you know, either the objects are actually there or we are collectively generating it as we go. There is. There may be no object. It's just simply us making what we see in front of our eyes. Like it's hard to tell where where the power rendering is. Rendering and hallucination. Yeah, and technically that's what it is. It comes down to um, how do we program it? Can we program it? If so, what are we going to program? If I told you you could do that, it's like yeah. what? I can what program do I the game. Yeah, what do I want? It, yeah, how do I want to help others? We yeah, don't need, yeah. but even then, we don't even allow ourselves to think about that too so important so to it's a combination of whether we're in a simulation or not like even if we are and if we have all the power we don't even ask those questions if we aren't and this is all we have we could still do something about it you know what's the source code um i th i think we are an, ex an extension of something like i don't i don't think there's more beyond that i mean let's it, ask it, you about it, this it is beyond the yeah. 3d reality yeah. Do we come into these earth suits into the playground? Um, so there's two ways to go about this. Either we can all come up with a story and that would be the real answer. So I, I, sometimes yeah. I, I can't tell whether that there is something making this happening or it's up to us to come up with a story that we can then prove in a weird way. Like it, in a way we're, yeah. we're very biased. If everything's connected, we can show the connections to whatever narrative we want. So that, 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 but then it comes down to, I don't really care what's causing this. I'm here now and I, I wanna have a good time. At least I want you to think about it. Uh, um, but yeah, I, you know, it's, we view 3D, technically there should be um, other dimensions. Are they controlling us? Are we puppets? Is there a feedback? Are there no dimensions? It's simply just like, is we're an extension of something altogether. I personally have never, I don't know where I was before I was born or where, where I've never died. I've only seen outside of my eyes, so I don't know, you know? So it's just, yeah, it, yeah. it's, I, I, think, I think the beauty is the mystery. And when, when, when there yeah. is the mystery, we can, we, can, we can create what we want in front of us. At least right now, we're in the 3D reality, away. we can build it. Um, we're chipping away more and more at yeah. the source code. So, yeah, so the, it's, yeah. I think it's important to keep this in the back of our mind because sometimes I reached a point where I hit this existential wall and I just needed to come up with a story to keep myself going because there, there is no answer just yet. But yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe in the lang language and realm of science, we could describe these things. That's right. And I, I feel like sometimes if we develop, let's say, brain technologies to augment our brain, to see different spectrums of light, to see different forms of energy, then our perspective is different. So we might need to augment our brain to see more dimensions to make, Agreed. to even to measure them. So yes. we're, not, we're not in a position to even address or study or ask those questions. So it's like, it, it's a process. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, it's nice to think about it, you know. 
Uh, I think we are in a position to ask the questions. It's more about... The details aren't there. Yeah, not yet. And we have to build the capacity to be able to poke at the source code um, and gain a better understanding of source code of the brain, source code of civilization, um, of what is greater than us, why we came here, all these types of questions. Last question is, what's the most beautiful thing in the world? Awesome question. Um, I think beauty to me is novelty. So it's like, it comes from an emergence of something I've never experienced before, awe. You know, I think it comes from nature. And I think the feeling fundamentally comes from relatedness and connectedness with whatever I'm experiencing. Um, sometimes it feel like, feels like I'm injecting the meaning in the beauty. And sometimes it's really just a little surprise, you know, sometimes. And I, I, I think I kind of equate beauty synonymously with like awe and wonder. But also um, this feeling of connectedness with anything like I I could find beauty in a pebble sometimes if you look at it long enough so it's just this idea Mm -hmm. that we're here and there are things that are around us um, that are miraculous Um, yeah so yeah and I I I think that question is inherently um, the whole point of beauty is that it's it's what's to come I what I find beautiful is riding that dragon over the sunset you know it's like it's an experience I I can't I might not even imagine I might not even know it until I see it so it's 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 a chase so that's what that's what the, yeah. that's the beauty yep, of it <laughs> this has been very yeah. very fun and we have done so many interviews where we talk to different leaders at the edge about the new codes that yeah. can maximize flourishing and i'm really happy that we spent a good chunk of time talking about that yeah. it's a really outside the box thinking about yeah. about it and i love that yeah Roxy, thank you so much for awesome, coming yeah. on the show and, and teaching uh, us yeah thank anyone you. wants to build a city i don't know how but it needs people let's get together <laughs> let's make things happen <laughs> you heard that <laughs> uh thanks everyone for tuning in we love you very much thank you so much also Go and check out the link below to Alexi's work and reach out, help build this new code. Let's deploy these new codes into the existing infrastructure or obsolete it, make some new infrastructure. And everyone, support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Our links are below for simulation. Help us out. Also help out the organizations that you believe in around the world. And share more conversations like this with other people, your families, your friends, your coworkers online. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love you very much, and we'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Peace. <laughs> Damn, that was, awesome. that was, that it, was fucking it, it lit. It went better than I, than I thought it would. And that's the stuff I wanted to touch, too.